tonight, struggling to keep up. A blistering new report finds Canada's asylum system is overwhelmed and backlogged. Is Ottawa doing enough to fix it? Still into oncoming traffic. This guy's gonna kill somebody. A dramatic video calling attention to the growing crystal meth crisis on the prairie. How the cheap drug is fueling violent crime. It's more than just a trend. This is going to be a long-term shift in eating habits. Meatless goes mainstream, and it's not just vegans fueling the $50 billion industry. The big business behind plant-based products. This is The Nutshell. We begin the hour with breaking news out of Ottawa involving the controversy surrounding one of Canada's former top military commanders and allegations of political interference. Tonight, CBC News has confirmed that the two-year legal battle against Vice Admiral Mark Norman is expected to be dropped, heading off what would have been a politically explosive trial for the Trudeau Liberals. Norman, once second in command of the Canadian Armed Forces, is charged with breach of trust for allegedly leaking government secrets about the $700 million shipbuilding deal. David Cochran is here with what this all means. And David, what can we expect in the Ottawa court tomorrow morning? Yeah, Ian, Mark Norman was supposed to be in court tomorrow for a routine update on the status of his case, but we got a cryptic email this evening which suggested that this routine appearance would not be routine. The Public Prosecution Service emailed reporters to remind them of the appearance at this specific time in the specific courtroom and suggesting you may wish to attend. And we know why, because sources now confirmed to CBC News that prosecutors will use this appearance to drop the charges against Norman. Now, this is a detail first reported by the National Post, and this is quite the detail, because Norman is the former commander of the Navy, and he has been accused of leaking cabinet secrets in relation to a $700 million shipbuilding deal to lease a supply vessel, but tomorrow, all of that is going to go away. And this presumably will be seen as a major victory for Norman, who's maintained his innocence, and this has also been a high-profile case with high stakes for the Liberal Party. Yeah, he's maintained his innocence, and Norman's lawyers have alleged political interference in this case, claiming that the Prime Minister's office, the Privy Council's office, they tried to orchestrate the prosecution. They've also alleged that former Cabinet Minister Scott Bryson tried to kill the lease deal on behalf of a rival shipyard. Now, all of those allegations have been denied, but they were poised to be litigated in a trial that could coincide with the federal election. Well, the prosecutor's decision to drop the charges means that will not happen. There are specific reasons for making this decision. Well, Ian, those won't be known until they appear in court tomorrow. All right, thanks, David. David Cochran okay. in Ottawa. No doubt this will be a big story in Ottawa tomorrow. We'll be watching the reaction, but for now, Andrew, you have a couple of other big political stories making news tonight. Yeah, that's right, Ian. A new Auditor General's report is harshly critical of how the government has handled the wave of people seeking asylum in Canada. The backlog and wait times for asylum claims are now worse than when the system was last reformed in 2012. Two-thirds of claims currently now are postponed, which uh, significantly increases the wait time. The report calls the system outdated, inefficient, and overly rigid. The consequence? A backlog of more than 70,000 claims by the end of last year. The expected two-year wait time could become five years by 2024. And there are security concerns, potentially hundreds of case files where identity checks or even criminal checks weren't done. Our Salima Shivji takes a closer look at the government response and the people caught in the middle. Vladimir Matsur is now settling into life in Montreal, coaching, but he spent 16 months in limbo after first arriving from Haiti seeking asylum two years ago. It was not easy because it's stressful. You, you have to think about it every time. We were wondering whether they forgot us. You cannot be here. That long wait is all too common. A steady stream of asylum seekers crossing the border on foot stretched the refugee claimant system beyond its limits. But Canada's Auditor General says the system needs an overhaul, with three agencies struggling to share information, much filled out by hand or sent by fax. 
and without efficiency improvements, just throwing more money at, uh, at to increase the capacity, uh, more needs to be done. The Liberals are throwing money at the system, $200 million more. But according to the Immigration Minister, this report is already out of date. He says his government has hired more staff and streamlined the process in an effort to catch up. The previous government simply didn't fund the system uh, for the volumes that they were receiving. They actually uh, put together some um, half-baked reforms in 2012. The Conservatives today were quick uh, to shoot that all, down. I cannot believe that like six weeks left in Parliament after four years that they're coming out here and saying that it's Stephen Harper's fault. That's just patently ridiculous. She says the Liberals should also take responsibility for another lapse, where in some cases biometric screening, which includes fingerprints, for criminal checks wasn't done. I guess I'm concerned with sort of the blasé attitude that like a what is still a significant margin of error, I think it was 400 cases that were cited, is somehow insignificant. The government says other screening measures worked and nobody slipped through the cracks. A back and forth on a wedge issue that's sure to dominate, with an election looming and both parties keen to blame each other. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Ottawa. Now, auditors didn't just look at border problems. They also looked at how the RCMP equips officers for active shooter situations. And according to the report, some Mounties still don't have access to hard body armor or semi-automatic rifles. This almost five years after a shooter killed three officers in New Brunswick. The force has purchased more armor and guns since then, but they're not evenly spread around. And another problem, government call centers. The AG notes half of the 16 million people who call either can't get through, are left on hold for more than half an hour, or are simply disconnected. The Liberals say they'll hire more agents and install new phone systems to fix that problem. But as you've seen, this all gets very political very quickly. Right now, the federal Conservatives are leading in the polls. They say the only real way to fix Ottawa is to elect a new Prime Minister in October. And the man who wants that job began laying out his vision for Canada today. Katie Simpson examines Andrew Scheer's first big policy pitch. The next Prime Minister of Canada, l'honorable Andrew Scheer. In Montreal, the heart of Justin Trudeau's home turf, Andrew Scheer delivered a scathing assessment of the Prime Minister's leadership on the world stage. The Conservative leader used a speech to a high-profile business lunch to say Trudeau was doomed from the start. The profound arrogance of Mr. Trudeau's words foreshadowed how the new Prime Minister would conduct Canada's foreign affairs with style, over substance. There can be Scheer argued Trudeau has made a mess of result. governing by that alienating way, allies like Japan, ticket. India and the US and by showing weakness in dealing with Russia and China. If this government isn't willing to stand up to China when two Canadians are unlawfully imprisoned and billions of dollars in trade is under attack, it never will. The Conservatives are the only ones who can right the ship is at the core of Scheer's message. And through foreign policy pledges, he broadly laid out how he would be different from Trudeau. Foreign affairs is something very serious, and instead of taking that seriously, he spent a big chunk of his speech attacking the Prime Minister. I guess the leader of the opposition has to think everything's a mess. I mean, he's entitled to describe foreign policy however he wants to. Meanwhile, we're down in Washington talking about trade for Canadians. Trudeau's team is quietly worried. Scheer may be able to capitalize on the success of the Conservative parties provincially, though Liberals hope he'll be overshadowed by Premiers Doug Ford and Jason Kenney, the larger personalities in the Conservative movement. Scheer is aware of that possibility, and that's why he'll be trying to get as much attention as he can on his own in the coming weeks. It's no coincidence Scheer picked Montreal to kick off his series of policy speeches. Quebec voters are the gateway to forming government, and all party leaders are expected to spend plenty of time here in the months to come. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Montreal. Plot thickens. Okay, uh, Adrian, let's turn to a developing story right here in Toronto. Yeah, you bet. We are looking at a fire, six-alarm fire that raged at a West End high school all day long. For 150 firefighters, it was grueling for the investigators, suspicious. And for a community and nearly a 1,000 students and staff, it's just heartbreaking. Is it emotional for you to see your school in this state? When you invest 
time into your stuff, into, yes. The fire blanketed the sky with gray smoke. The school itself likely burned beyond recovery. This was more than a building. It was a place of history and memory, much of it ashes now. And as Ali Shiasong tells us, this was the second fire at the same school in as many days, adding questions to a day of frantic action. Well, I woke up and it smelled like fire, or just um, smoky in my room, and my dad knocked on my door just to let me know to prepare to evacuate. And it's looking like I'm needing to evacuate now. <laughs> Blocks of the neighborhood around York Memorial Collegiate were smoked out. The officers came and knocked on the doors and said we all had to come out because, uh, you know, the fire is out of control. Firefighters struggled to contain it all day. Water cannons are blasting through the windows. Smoke is seeping through the bricks. I'm told this part of the school might collapse soon. It did. The fire also means a loss of history. The high school was a kind of monument to soldiers who died in the First and Second World Wars. It, it's gorgeous. The high school marked its 90-year anniversary just yesterday. This is going to be a heartbreak for many, for many of us, including myself. This is the second fire in two days. Yesterday afternoon, firefighters responded to a smaller blaze in the auditorium. Officials are treating them as separate and distinct. With the first fire being suspicious, then we have to look at the second fire and how that fire started. So there are concerns about the whole, the whole thing, quite frankly. The result of the investigation will take weeks. But the sense of loss is immediate. Even though it's just our first year, we made so many memories and it's kind of saddening how it can just burn out and just, you know, disappear at such a quick moment. Ali Chiasson, CBC News, Toronto. We have heard a lot about the deadly opioid crisis, but police in the prairies are sounding the alarm about the growing popularity of another dangerous drug. Methamphetamine is fueling violent crime. Tonight, Bonnie Allen shows us one dramatic example, and we should tell you the man in the video wasn't badly hurt. He's dosing gasoline on himself, and he's uh, threatening to burn himself up here. He's At this there. moment, 37-year-old Terrence Morn is high on methamphetamine and has been for seven days. Oh, yes, he has just... Uh, lit himself on fire. Police are able to extinguish the flames and save his life, but it could have turned out much differently. Still into oncoming traffic. For hours before, a police plane had tracked Morn as he sped through Saskatoon blowing stop signs. This guy's going to kill somebody. The video was played in court and illustrates the growing meth epidemic on the prairies. Compared to fentanyl, crystal meth is cheaper, less lethal and lasts longer. It can also trigger unpredictable violent behavior like this assault on a nurse in Winnipeg last year. We're seeing cases where they're combative, physically combative with officers, um, where they're carrying weapons, where they're failing to stop when they're driving a motor vehicle. Those all add to what I would call extremely dangerous situations. Saskatoon police report more frequent deployment of full tactical units and the use of restraints in police cells to deal with meth users. If they became psychotic before, after a period of use, it would take less methamphetamine to become psychotic again in the future. Dr. Peter Butt is an addiction specialist who says crystal meth use is a mental disorder that rewires the brain. Some people in recovery really see it as a form of a zombie apocalypse in the community. Tiffany Newby agrees. She used crystal meth for five years. You have no soul is the best way to explain it. You're not, you're not who you used to be. It takes all your happiness. It just... Yeah, you're just a shell of who you used to be, pretty much. The vehicle's on fire. The man in this video pleaded guilty to dangerous driving and assault on a police officer. But police say the meth crisis won't be solved in the courtroom. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Regina. We're live here in the National, and here's some of the other stories we're following. A terrifying afternoon in Colorado when two students armed with guns opened fire at a school. My daughter called me. And she said, Mommy, there's gunshots at the school. 
An 18-year-old male student was killed. Seven others in hospital tonight with injuries. Two suspects are in custody. Both are students. One's an adult, the other a youth. And police say it's still too early to determine a motive. A Calgary landlord is now charged with second-degree murder of a mother and her 22-month-old daughter. Jasmine Lovett and Aaliyah Sanderson had been living with Robert Leeming in his townhouse before they went missing. The bodies were discovered yesterday. Leeming was charged late last night. Well, as, as you can expect, he's um, under a lot of stress. Leeming will make his first court appearance next week. Ontario's Integrity Commissioner has dismissed an allegation that Doug Ford broke conflict of interest laws. The NDP lodged a complaint after the former Deputy Commissioner of the Ontario Provincial Police was fired when he was seeking a promotion. Brad Blair was a critic of Ford's. The Integrity Commissioner saying today there was no evidence that Ford was involved or sought to influence the decision. The announcement of a new Edmonton Oilers general manager today was expected by many, but what came as a surprise was the condition of the team's owner, the man on the right, Daryl Cates. It was revealed today he's been struggling with a life-threatening sinus infection for the past few years and that the illness has a 50-50 survival rate. It's the reason Cates hasn't been seen publicly for some time. For a little guy whose name and face the world doesn't know yet, there's an awful lot of excitement over Prince Harry and Meghan's newborn son. Well, today his uncle Will and Aunt Kate told reporters they're absolutely thrilled, of course. I'm looking forward to seeing them um, in the next few few days when things quiet down. And, uh, I'm very pleased and glad to welcome my brother to the uh, Sleep Deprivation Society that is parenting. So, yeah, be, uh... <laughs> the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge said they don't know the baby's name yet either. And as Renee Filipponi tells us, royal watchers just can't wait. <laughs> There is always a buzz when it's time for the changing of the guard. But the pomp has extra punch these days. This couple especially has been such a game changer um, with the fact that Meghan is so different than um, anything else the royal family has ever seen and so excited for this baby boy. A day after the birth, Zari Kabu reflects on what it means. Meghan's mixed race heritage is what makes this so special for her and her family. They're embracing the more modern aspect of things, embracing where the world is moving towards. And it's about time, according to this UK journalist. Because it's 2019 and there are mixed race families everywhere, but we've never seen them on this level in British society. Harry and Meghan are all about change. They've been keeping details secret, unlike past royal births. Reports are the baby was born in a London hospital, with some pointing to this private facility in London. The Duchess of York delivered her two girls there. The palace won't confirm it. Even close family are still in the dark about some things. Today, the Queen was congratulated by former Prime Minister Jean Chrétien following an event. Oh, life is good for you, Your Majesty. Yes, thank you. Congratulations and other great grandchildren. <laughs> How many of them have you got now? You beat me by one. The Queen is expected to pay a visit to Frogmore Cottage in Windsor, where Harry, Meghan and the baby live. If Harry sticks with the plan he announced, the new family of three will make its public debut tomorrow. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Windsor, England. The waiting game continues. <laughs> okay, uh, still ahead on the national. A marathon running nurse nabs a world record and overturns a dress code all in the same day. Plus, part two in our series about guns in Canada tonight. Who gun control legislation actually affects the most? And just in time for barbecue season, meatless meat takes off. We're dealing with a much more educated consumer who understands more about the foods that they're eating overall. The big business of vegan food, next. That's impossible. It tasted just like a Whopper should taste. Yet another sign, meat free is going mainstream. Burger King is rolling out the impossible burger across the US. It looks like beef, tastes like beef, but is made from soy. And not to be outdone, McDonald's is now selling a similar burger in Germany, one of its biggest international markets. It's not clear if McDonald's will sell it here as well, but there is a demand. Diane Buckner looks at how companies in Canada are capitalizing on the popularity of plant-based protein. It looks like blue cheese, but this product is made from cashews. 
The brand, Nuts for Cheese, was founded by a vegetarian chef who knew that a growing number of consumers want alternatives to animal proteins. We were at the farmer's market and people would walk by and say, oh my God, what is vegan cheese? That's probably disgusting. Turns out Margaret Coons was on top of one of the hottest trends in the food business, protein from plants. Nowadays, instead of selling in small farmer's markets, her products are in 800 stores across Canada. And we've um, tripled revenues every year since we started, and I think that growth has been sort of, uh, I haven't had a lot of moments to, to catch my breath. That patty is 100% plant-based protein. It was actually burgers that helped ignite the plant-based trend. We're dealing with a much more educated consumer who understands more about the foods that they're eating overall, and they're looking for that perception of health and wellness, and these plant-based burgers really tie into that. Those same patties that A&W popularized, made with protein from peas, have just been introduced in Canadian grocery stores. Other brands are coming too. Then uh, we most recently launched under the Light Life brand our burger. The CEO of Canadian meat giant Maple Leaf Foods is jumping on the meat-free bandwagon. The company has spent $300 million to buy two leading American plant-based protein companies. There's meatballs, there are sliced meat meats. Meatballs. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, there are various uh, sliced meats for uh, deli meats. Uh. And it's spending another $300 million to build a meat-free plant in Indiana. Given the compound growth rates in plant-based protein, which are, which are hyper-growth today, it's growing at a, cat a category growing at well over 30% a year at this moment. These businesses are getting a boost from the Canada Food Guide. It now recommends that consumers choose protein foods that come from plants more often. But are meat lovers really ready to embrace these new alternatives? It's more than just a trend. This is going to be a long-term shift in eating habits. Even so, insiders say going meatless will be an occasional thing for most consumers. Sales of regular meat are growing as well. For example, uh, we've seen probably two or three years of the most robust growth in bacon consumption in North America than maybe in the last 20 years, right? And uh, people clearly are saying, like, uh, I want my bacon. Back at Nuts for Cheese. It's just going to become more normal that people are eating things that make them feel better and um, are better for them. And that gives Margaret Coons confidence that consumers' newfound love for plant-based protein isn't just a fad. Diane Buckner, CBC News, Toronto. Okay, still ahead on the National. He was a champion for those who were once pushed to the margins. And now, even in death, commands the respect of the world's most powerful. Who was Jean Vanier? But first, we continue our series on guns in Canada. Does gun control legislation reduce gun violence? We're just wondering if whether or not it's a good use of resources, if this is actually one of the problems in our society or not, or if it's just uh, creating a... Uh, a large database of firearms that really isn't needed. Tonight, amid a rising gun homicide rate and a growing debate over what to do about it, our special series on gun violence continues with a focus on the gun control laws. Some say they persecute, some say they protect, but in recent years, the trend has been towards looser laws. The Liberals have taken a step in the other direction, but when it comes to gun laws, Ottawa has learned it just pays to keep your head down. Terence McKenna on the politics and price of Canada's stance on gun control. Anne-Marie Lemay. Last December, the Prime Minister and the Quebec Premier gathered in Montreal with the relatives and friends impacted by the worst mass shooting in Canadian history. Geneviève Bergeron. The murder of 14 young women at the École Polytechnique. Marise Lagan. They read out the names of the victims. And Annie Turcotte. In December 1989, a gunman barged into the school, separated the men from the women, and shot the female engineering students because he said he hated feminists who had ruined his life. His name was Mark Lepin. The tragedy was a turning point in the Canadian gun control debate. 
Je suis sûre que je vais être rappelée de ça pendant toute ma vie. Heidi Rathjen was there as a 23-year-old student. I was in a student union room, and somebody just came in and said, there's a guy with a gun, close the door. We had no clue what was happening. Couldn't believe anybody would get hurt or much less die. After the tragedy, Heidi Rathjen became a leader of the gun control movement. And so we started a petition to ban assault weapons. And that petition became the largest petition in Canadian history with 560,000 signatures. Then Conservative Justice Minister Kim Campbell introduced the first mild gun control legislation in 1990. But then the Kretzian Liberal government brought in much tougher legislation in 1995, including a long gun registry. So six years after the tragedy, we got just basic controls on gun owners with possession and acquisition permits, controls on guns, guns are registered, they're all accounted for, limits on what type of guns um, could be uh, allowed in, so a ban on military assault weapons and large capacity magazines. The Conservative Party and the gun lobby went to war against the Liberal legislation and it was repealed by the Harper government in 2012. Then Public Safety Minister Vic Taves. Our position on the long gun registry has been clear. It does nothing to help put an end to gun crimes, nor has it saved one Canadian life. In fact, the number of gun homicides declined by about 50% during the years of the gun registry and has climbed by about the same amount since it was repealed. Thank you very much. Yes. In the last federal election, Justin Trudeau campaigned to bring back some gun control measures. Uh, here today... And now the Liberals have introduced Bill C-71 which includes some minor adjustments regarding gun store record keeping and background checks. It is a step in the right direction. C-71 does contain important measures, so we're going to support it and get what we want. But basically, under the Conservatives, we went five steps back, and now with the Liberals, who got elected to a majority, on the basis of, a, of an election platform that contained gun control promises, um, we're going one step forward. Ontario gun store owner Wes Winkle is a spokesman for the pro-gun movement in Canada. He objects to Bill C-71's new requirements for gun stores to keep sales records for 20 years. It, it contains all of the firearms records from... Data that can be accessed by policemen only with a search warrant based on evidence that a crime has been committed. He compares that to the former long gun registry. So now again, we're tying the firearm to the buyer. I guess that would sound reasonable to most people. What's the matter with that? I think for the most part, people don't, don't understand the volume of firearm transactions and how many actually sell. And uh, it puts on a very onerous process on the dealer to have to do that recording all the time. I guess a lot of people at home would, would, would think, okay, you're making arguments that this is inconvenient for you. They would say, tough luck. We want guns to be more safe. We want the system to be more safe. Absolutely, and, and uh, the industry understands that. Nobody has more interest in, in keeping guns out of the hands of criminals than the industry does. They're just wondering if whether or not it's a good use of resources, if this is actually one of the problems in our society or not, or if it's just uh, creating a, a, a large database of firearms that really isn't needed. Bill C-71 will again make it illegal to resell a gun to someone without checking to see if they have a proper firearms license. There's a huge loophole that was created by the Conservatives in eliminating the mandatory verification of a permit. This will come back with C-71, and this is one of the reasons why we support the bill. Right now, Canadian gun buyers face a background check of only five years of criminal and mental health records. Bill C-71 would remove that five-year limit. There's some concerns around that, whether or not it will attach more stigmatism to people coming forth with mental health concerns if they know that their, their firearms collections may be at risk or they're licensed to, to have firearms. I think most people at home would say, a bigger concern to me is whether that person has a gun. At that point, I think if somebody's struggling with their, with their thoughts, I think we'd like them to seek mental, or, uh, professional help. If it attaches a stigmatism mm -hmm. to them bringing forth a, a mental health concern, that's our concern there. These mental health concerns were highlighted by the case of Lionel Desmond, a former Canadian soldier who returned from Afghanistan to Nova Scotia with post-traumatic stress disorder and ended up shooting his mother, his wife, his daughter, and himself in 2017. Many of the shooters in the U.S. were veterans with PTSD. 
it's a huge risk factor and obviously uh, people with mental illness should not this type of mental Ill illness should not have access to weapons it's much too dangerous like do you sell AR-15s here or was it yes. although it is not part of bill c-71 the Liberal government is considering further restriction of what are commonly called military assault weapons like the AR-15, which has been used in numerous mass shootings in the United States. So that is the infamous AR-15 rifle. Mm -hmm. It's a semi-automatic only action. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see it only has a, a setting for a safety and for a fire mode. Mm -hmm. In the military, they have a full auto designation, and, th and that, that's called the M16, and that's uh, prohibited in Canada. The look is what uh, distinguishes it. People think it looks a lot more military or, or uh, and therefore more dangerous. It, mm -hmm. it actually is not at all. It's, it's quite humorous to us in the industry because it fires a relatively small cartridge. That's, that's not as powerful as most of the hunting semi-automatics that we sell. But uh, as far as uh, mechanically, it, it's, to us in the industry, it's quite laughable to think that this is more dangerous than another semi-automatic rifle. There was a masked man came in and just started shooting. The AR-15 rifle was used in the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting in Connecticut. I was in the gym and I heard like seven loud booms. The First Baptist Church shooting in Texas. And in the Parkland School shooting last year in Florida. He went up and down the hallway, shooting into the classrooms he shot through my door. Gun control advocates think it is absurd to debate whether an AR-15 can be defined as an assault weapon. When a weapon allows a perpetrator to kill dozens of people in a matter of minutes, that gun should not be allowed in private hands. These are the weapons that we want off our streets, out of our communities, out of the hands of ordinary civilians. It's not worth it. The benefits to the few who use them for recreational purposes are much too small compared to the risk for public safety. The key point about military-style weapons is how many bullets they can shoot. The magazine holds a maximum of five cartridges, and it pulls out like that. The cartridges go inside here. Even if a magazine looks large, by law in Canada, it must have a pin that limits it to holding only five bullets. Five rounds in Canada. Um, again, uh, magazines uh, in parts of the United States and that will hold 20 rounds or 30 rounds, mm -hmm. but in Canada they're, they're restricted to five. On the internet, you can easily buy large capacity magazines that could hold up to 100 bullets, even though the law in Canada imposes a five bullet limit. Okay, so I've got my Glock. This is how those large magazines can be put to use. Ridiculous magazine. And uh, we're going to make a mess. In the cases of the last three mass shooters in Canada, Alexandra Bissonnette at the Quebec City Mosque, Richard Bain, who attacked the Quebec Premier's election night celebration, and Justin Bourque, who killed three police officers in Moncton, the shooters simply removed the pin that legally limited their magazines to five bullets. It's ridiculous. Somebody who's intent on, on killing exponential number of people just has to remove the pin. They don't care that it's illegal. Mm -hmm. They're gonna, they're, they're about to commit murder, and often they will kill themselves afterwards. Alexandre Bissonnet had an assault weapon with two 30 bullet ammunition clips, and everybody in that mosque would have been dead had that gun not, gun not jammed. Uh, obviously, uh, we we sell handguns as well. And uh, Wes Winkle has a handgun section of his store that is only unveiled on request. Otherwise, uh, they stay in a display mode only. So, what percentage of your business is handgun? Forty-five percent of our firearms businesses is handguns. Uh, the industry's identified a lot of uh, the individuals growing up uh, playing first-person shooter video games and getting an interest in the industry that way. And then uh, as they get older, they decide to get a license and to try it in real life. So uh, that's one thing we've seen growth in. But we, uh, the handgunning, and especially uh, in ladies and youth, the growth in handgun shooting has been phenomenal. So how big is this industry in Canada? How many jobs are relying so, on this? So we have uh, a little over 4,000 businesses uh, handling firearms in Canada and a total of 25,000 employees. So those are full-time employees that earn a living inside this industry in, uh, in a safe and, and structured manner. Mm -hmm.
So a handgun ban would would represent what to you, do you think? So we estimate that we could lose as many as 13 to 14,000 jobs in Canada if we were to have a handgun ban. Canada's present and proposed gun control legislation falls under the purview of Public Security Minister Ralph Goodale, who declined our request for an interview. Mr. Goodale often speaks privately about his desire to hold on to the Liberal Party's rural seats in Parliament. Gun control advocates think that approach is wrong-headed. The vast majority of, not only of Canadians, but of gun owners are in favour of banning assault weapons. Polling research has showed that if the Liberal government would take a strong stand of gun control, they would gain support, they would gain votes, as opposed to sitting on the fence now, trying to please everybody, pleasing nobody, and, and the worst part is not protecting public health. In the middle of the night, another shooting victim is collected from the streets of Toronto. The mayors of Toronto, Montreal, and other cities have asked for a handgun ban. But as the bodies pile up, the federal government seems almost paralyzed about what to do about it. Terence McKenna, CBC News, Toronto. Now, a common argument made against gun control laws is they don't restrict criminals from buying guns illegally. That is where the National goes next for the next installment of our series on gun violence. Superintendent Jason Crowley of the Windsor Police says gun trafficking is driven by the lucrative market in Canada for unlicensed firearms. You will see a gun, a firearm uh, purchased in the States for potentially, I don't know, $200, 300 and they'll go in the streets for $3,000, $3,500. Mm -hmm. So very lucrative for the people that are involved in these kind of uh, activities. They hide them, they hide them in uh, cars, in, in uh, panels in their cars, uh, maybe on them, uh, all kinds of, uh, they're ingenious, uh, to be honest, uh, the way they've, they've come up with hiding. We are live on The National. The trial of former Nexium leader Keith Rainier started in Brooklyn today. Prosecutors say the 58-year-old recruited women into the cult-like organization, turning them into sex slaves, even branding them with his initials. The trial is expected to last as long as six weeks. Rainier has pleaded not guilty to charges including sex trafficking and child pornography. Voters in Denver are deciding whether to decriminalize magic mushrooms. The measure would end criminal penalties for personal use and possession, but it would still be illegal under both state and federal law. The ballot question being asked during today's mayoral election. We are tracking the results, and right now 54% of voters are against it. He does not deserve to be in a supermax prison. He has never committed a violent act. He's an innocent person. Former Baywatch star Pamela Anderson today paying a visit to the London jail where Julian Assange is being held. She's long been a supporter of his, visiting him a number of times at the Ecuadorian embassy in London. Assange is currently serving time for a bail violation and is fighting extradition to the United States. Tributes are pouring in for a Canadian humanitarian who's had global influence. Jean Vanier died today at age 90. He was a champion for people with intellectual disabilities. He founded the L'Arche Movement, more than 150 communities around the world where people with and without developmental disabilities live and work together. Today, Pope Francis praised Vanier's work with those he characterized as forgotten. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said Vanier made the world a better, more inclusive place. Funny enough, Vanier himself might have rejected the accolades had he heard them. He once said, we are all called to work together and love each other, and we don't have to be saints to do that. Casperussi spent the day in one of Vanier's L'Arche communities, learning about its founder and meeting the people who call it home. I... He was called a village elder to the world. Jean Vanier, the son of a former governor general, an officer in the Navy, a man of faith, a teacher of philosophy. What was once farmland just north of Toronto is Larch Daybreak, one of the more than 150 such communities around the world that Vanier founded, a place offering refuge and safety for intellectually disabled people. I feel very much that 
the mentally deficient are the people who have no voice in our land. And I think that there have to be people who can speak for them. <laughs> Longtime friend Mary Bastido first met Vanier at a large community in the 70s. We all become more human as we welcome others and move beyond the walls. His life's been about breaking through barriers and taking down walls. My Vanier spoke of his passion in 2015. People with disabilities have been humiliated. They've been told they're no good. They've been called names and all that stuff. No doubt about it, Vanier helped shape many young lives, like Marianne Larcina, who still keeps a precious photo of her trip to France, where she met her hero. What do you remember from here, from this time, this picture of you and Jean Vanier? Just a very good, good friend, for friend forever. Here, core residents like Amanda Winnington Ingram live, work, and learn side by side with assistance, belonging to a community and bringing diverse people together. Winnington Ingram has lived here since 2005 and speaks for many others who have lost their special friend. I really miss him a lot in my heart. Because he is in my heart, he is inside him. Right, right, right here. That's nice. Yeah, because I love him. Cass Rusi, CBC News, Richmond Hill, Ontario. And you can read more about Jean Vanier and meet more of the people affected by his life's work on our Instagram page. Check it out, CBC, The National. Next on The National, our moment. I'm really happy and excited to see my family and my colleagues. And I can't wait to go my newsroom. Right now. Right now. There they are, dedicated to the core. The Reuters journalists jailed in Myanmar go home. Their reunion moment is our moment, but first. In case you missed it, the British nurse who smashed a world record for fastest marathon while wearing a nurse's uniform, and yes, that is a Guinness category, is claiming victory again. A couple of Sundays ago, Jessica Anderson, who ran for a local charity, completed the London Marathon in a blistering three hours, eight minutes and 22 seconds while attired in her nursing scrubs. But the folks at Guinness World Records disqualified her over a technicality. According to the rules, which apparently date back to 1942, a nurse's uniform must consist of a white or blue dress, an apron, and a traditional cap. Well, you can imagine how that went over. Anderson protested. And so did members of the nursing profession from all over the world under the hashtag what nurses wear, including no small number of men. Today, Guinness saw the light. Anderson has now been named the official winner, and the rules have been changed. Five hundred and eleven days. That is how long two Reuters journalists spent behind bars in Myanmar. But today, they were finally released. Now, their case caught the world's attention, and they became symbols for the importance of press freedom. Tonight, their welcomed return is our moment. This is what freedom looks like for Walon and Cho So U. Their smiles impossible to hide. In the prison and also around the world, people who are uh, wishing to release us. So I would like to say thank you very much. They landed in jail for their journalism, an investigation into the killing of 10 Rohingya men and boys in Myanmar. While behind bars, many around the world fought for their release. They even won the Pulitzer Prize, but it was freedom that was the biggest win. I'm really happy and excited to see my family and my colleagues. And I can't wait to go my newsroom right now. Right now, right now. Still, their number one priority is reuniting with their loved ones. I usually bring iced coffee for her all the time, being home late. So I, I will buy coffee for her and I, I will see how much I love her. <laughs> And after a long and really emotional day, it is hard not to have a smile on your face. Hmm. So no wonder they're happy. They, they had been sentenced under the Official Secrets Act, uh, told that they'd be jailed for seven years. Uh, when they're actually released, though, interestingly, there were 6,500 prisoners granted amnesty by the Myanmar uh, government. It, it's something that, that they do around, you know, the time of the new year. So uh, they were among many happy people. So a time for celebration, obviously, a win, obviously, but we can't lose sight of the fact that 
they did spend 500 days in jail for doing something they should have spent no time in jail for. Reuters has reposted the article. Mm -hmm. You can look for yourself and realize that no one should have should have faced this uh, this ordeal because of that article. Well, and just to underline that point, I mean, there there was a price that was paid, right? And you caught glimmers of that at the end uh, of just that moment there, where you see their families. I mean, one of the men has a three-year-old daughter. The other, whose whose child was born after he was arrested, mm -hmm. uh, but good to be back home for them, I'm sure. That's The National for this May 7th. Good night. Good night.